Okay, so the pre-class notes for class two are all about chapter one from Physics for Scientists and Engineers. And the goal of this chapter is to introduce the fundamental concepts of motion. So there's four basic types of motion. Let's take a look at these, linear, circular, projectile, and rotational. So how do we make a motion diagram? Well, first, think about an old-style movie of a moving object. Uh, each separate photo is called frame, and the car here, since it's moving, is in a different position in each frame. Well, now imagine cutting up the individual frames and stacking them on top of each other. This composite photo shows the object's position at several equally spaced instants of time. So the car is moving, so you see four cars. The palm tree is not moving, so you just see it sitting there. This is called a motion diagram. Often we can treat an object like a car as if all its mass were concentrated at a single point. We don't care about the shape of the car or that it has an antenna or anything. We just, uh, it's called the particle model. We just want to know where it is. So here is a motion diagram of a car that's slowing down using the particle model. We've labeled the, the dots 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 to show that this is increasing time and the dots are getting closer together so it must be slowing down. Here's a motion diagram in two dimensions. We have the x-axis and the y-axis and it's a basketball and <clears throat> we're told that there's 0.5 second intervals between frames. So you get up to frame 4, it should be about 2 seconds after it started down here. One way to locate the ball is to draw an arrow from the origin, where x and y equals 0, to the position. This arrow shows the position of the ball at frame 4. <clears throat> the length of the arrow is 15 meters, and the direction of the arrow is specified by this angle between the arrow and the x-axis. And so r, with a little arrow on top, is called the position vector. And the position vector r is one way of specifying position. The other way uh, is to use coordinates x, y. Either way is fine. Okay, to add two vectors. So we have a vector a and a vector b, which are drawn. And we want to find a vector c, which is called the vector sum a plus b. What we do is we take uh, b and we move it so that the tail of B attaches to the head of A. Then we draw what's called the resultant, which goes from the tail of A all the way over to the head of where B is now, and that is the sum A plus B, which we called C. So displacement. <clears throat> if an object has some initial position vector, r sub i, i for initial, and this subscript just labeling which r this is, and a final position r sub f, those are both vectors, uh, the displacement is defined as rf minus ri. So we've done vector addition, this is called vector subtraction. So with numbers, the way you could, can subtract them is you can add the negative. So for example, 5 minus 3 equals 2. You can also equivalently say 5 plus negative 3 equals 2. Well, we do the same thing with vectors. a minus b is a plus negative b, where the negative of a vector is that a vector with the same length but pointing in the opposite direction. Okay, vector subtraction. So I have two vectors, a and b, as shown, and I want to find uh, vector d, which is a minus b, which is the same as a plus negative b. So the first thing I do is I find what the vector of negative b is. I do that by just erasing the arrow on this side and adding it up on the other side. Uh, negative b is the same length as b but in the opposite direction. And then I just add it. In the same way we add things from before, we're going to connect the head of a to the tail of b and then our final vector is from the tail of b up to the head, sorry, ta tail of a up to the head of b, and that is our difference, d. 
It's useful to consider a change in time. For example, that object that moved from Ri to Rf, you could say that at uh, when it was at position Ri, the time was t sub i. And when it was at its final position, the time was t sub f. The time interval tf minus ti is called delta t. And you might measure it with a stopwatch, for example. So now that we have position and time, we can find uh, speed. Speed is distance traveled divided by delta t. And for example, these guys, they all start at the same time. So the victory goes to the runner with the highest average speed. But this doesn't tell us anything about direction. It's a scalar quantity. If you want to know, uh, if you want to include direction, there's something called average velocity. Velocity is the displacement vector divided by delta t. So sometimes an object's velocity changes as it moves. This is uh, this means it's accelerating, and we say acceleration is the change in uh, is the rate of change of velocity. So if something goes from v1 to v2 in an interval delta t, delta v is the change in velocity, and the average acceleration is delta v divided by delta t. So you can measure the acceleration of a car, for example, if you know that it accelerates from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 6 seconds. You would take the uh, delta, uh, delta v, which would be 60, and divide it by 6, and you get 10 miles per hour per second. When an object is speeding up, that means the acceleration vectors, these yellow vectors, and the velocity vectors, the green vectors, are in the same direction. Uh, and when an object is slowing down, the uh, velocity and acceleration vectors point in op opposite directions. So here's a particle speeding up. Here's a particle that's slowing down. Its velocity is to the left, and its acceleration is to the right. Okay, solving problems in physics takes practice, and you'll get a lot of practice in this course doing the Mastering Physics problem sets and uh, working through end of chapter problems. And as you get more practice, you'll develop more confidence. But when you're getting started, it's good to know that there is a strategy that will kind of always work for you. Problem solving strategy. And this is what's suggested by Knight, so I thought I'd go through it. It's uh, model, visualize, solve, assess. So the first step is to model the situation. This means to come up with simplifying assumptions and you know, decide what it is, the object that you want, uh, try to figure out uh, what things you can ignore. The next step is visualize. That basically means to draw a diagram. Uh, very, very important first step is try to draw what's going on. could be a circle. You might set up coordinate axes, something like that. Uh, come up with the symbols that you want to represent, uh, position or time or something, and then also write down the equations that you think are going to be useful uh, to find what it is that you need. And then once you've set that up, the next step will be to solve those equations for what you need to find. Uh, easily, <laughs> easy to say, not always so easy to do, but you'll get better at it. Uh, and then lastly, you want to assess the answer that you get, which means uh, to ask the question, does it make sense? Okay. So whenever you specify a number in science, you need to specify units. And the system of units that we use around the world is called the Système International d'Unité, or SI units. So, for example, the SI unit of time is the second. And you can convert it to other things like minutes and, and hours, but the standard unit there is seconds. The SI unit of length is the meter. Turns out the SI unit of mass is the kilogram. It's actually equal to the mass of this standard kilogram, which is being uh, stored in France. Uh, it's not the gram for some reason, it's, it's the kilogram. And a gram is a thousandth of this standard unit. So many lengths, times, and masses are either much less than or much uh, greater than these standard units, one meter, one second, one kilogram. And so we have these common pre prefixes. So uh, giga means 10 times 10 to the power 9. Mega is 10 to the power 6. Kilo is 10 to the power 3. Centi, milli, micro, and nano. So these uh, prefixes denote various powers of 10 to make it easier to talk about quantities. So let's uh, do a, 
an example of converting between units. Let's say my height is six feet. What is this in centimeters? And what we know is that one foot equals 12 inches, and we know that one inch equals 2.54 centimeters. Perhaps we looked that up in a book. Well, since anything with, uh, that divided by itself equals one, we can set up these uh, numbers which are equal to one. For example, one foot divided by 12 inches, that equals one. Or upside down, 12 inches divided by one foot equals one. Also, using the second conversion there, uh, we know that one inch divided by 2.5 centimeters equals one, and 2.54 centimeters divided by one inch equals one. So, what we want to do, our problem is six feet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this six feet by the number one. And I have feet on the top, and I want to convert to centimeters, but I don't have a direct conversion. So first I'm going to convert to inches by con using our inches to feet conversion. So feet will be on the bottom so that it'll cancel, and inches will be on the top. And our conversion, we just look up here, was 12 inches equals one foot. So that gets us to inches. The next step is I want to convert to centimeters, what I'm trying to get, so I want centimeters on the top and inches on the bottom so that this inch will cancel this inch. And our number is 2.54 uh, centimeters is one inch. So this equals, just scroll over a little bit, it's 6 times 12 times 2.54. that on our calculator and we get uh, 182.88 uh, that's centimeters so it's about 183 centimeters okay significant figures so if you say that the length from here to there is 6.2 meters what you're implying there is that you might have rounded. The actual value might be somewhere between 6.15 and you round it up and as high as 6.25 or 6.24 or something and you round it down. So we say that the 6 and the 2 are significant figures. So a figure is like a digit. So this could also be two significant digits, digits or sig figs. Uh, the more, if you made a more precise measurement, if you were more careful, you could give more significant figures. Okay? And the appropriate number of significant figures is determined by what data you take, okay? So how well you measured it. If you are calculating numbers, so you have a few different numbers that you're multiplying together, then you follow the weakest link rule. The input value with the smallest number of significant figures determines the number of the significant figures to use in reporting the output value. So first we'll do some examples of counting sig figs, and then we'll do an example of using sig figs in a calculation. Okay, the first step in understanding significant figures is being able to count uh, how many sig figs are in a particular number. So 3.05. Well, 3 is significant, 0, and 5 they are all significant, so the number of sig figs is 3. 3 sig figs. Uh, 0 0.620. Well, the 6 is significant, the 2 is significant, the 0 is significant, but this one is not. This is a placeholder. So, I'll just put an arrow to that, and that again is three significant figures. What about the next one? 52,100. Well, uh, certainly the 5 and the 2 and the 1 are significant, but the zeros here at the end I think are just placeholders. So again, I would count that as three significant figures. However, if people put a point zero after that, then all of a sudden the five is significant, the two is significant, uh, this one is significant, and now all these zeros become significant. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six significant figures. So this is, it can be a bit ambiguous, so a nice way to uh, 
to write 52,100 is 5.21 times 10 to the 4. This is very clearly three significant figures, whereas with this one up here, we're not quite sure whether those last two zeros are significant or not. So this one we know for sure. 5.001, uh, this is significant, this is, this is, and this is, so that's four significant figures. Uh, 0 0.0012, only the one and the two are significant, whereas these ones all seem to be placeholders. And so this is just two significant figures. And a better way perhaps to write that is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. Same number, uh, but you clearly you can see here this has two significant figures. Okay, here's a problem, uh, the example problem for significant figures. You travel uh, 163 meters in 120 seconds. What was your average speed? Okay, so the distance is 163.1 meters. Time is 120 seconds. Uh, we know that average speed is distance divided by time. So that's 163.1 divided by 120. I get uh, 1.3591666667. So clearly, clearly this is way too many significant figures. If we look at these numbers, uh, D has four significant figures and T has two significant figures. The rule is the weakest link. We use two for our final answer. So that means I have to round this final answer to two significant figures. So all these things don't matter. Uh, it's 1.35 rounds up to uh, being 1.4. So 1.4 meters per second, don't forget the units, is the correct final answer.